Campinas, from the University of Campinas, and she will report on the Brazilian Initiative on Precision Medicine, the first publicly, publicly available genomic database in Latin, uh, Latin America. Please. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and I have the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we have been doing for the past two and a half years in terms of open science in genomic medicine. So uh, the Brazilian Initiative on Precision Medicine, BIPMED, uh, was launched uh, in a public event in November 2015 at FAPESP who is the uh, Sao Paulo uh, granting agency that supports research uh, in the state of Sao Paulo. And uh, on that occasion, uh, we launched the, publicly the initiative as well as our first product, which is the first uh, openly and publicly available genomic database in Latin America. Uh, uh, since then, we have uh, acted in, in different domains and uh, different disciplines. Uh, however, I, uh, I'm going to concentrate uh, this afternoon uh, on the open repository for genomic and health-related information. So the mission of BIPMED is to help to implement precision medicine in Brazil by acting as a catalytic element to foster collaboration among different stakeholders. And you can uh, visit us at uh, bitmed.org, and I encourage you to do so. And if you have any questions, uh, any suggestions or complaints, uh, there is an email for contact, and we would, we would appreciate very much any uh, input you could give us. So uh, the initiative is supported by uh, five research innovation and dissemination centers in the state of Sao Paulo, and they are represented here by the uh, symbols, that are located in different universities in Sao Paulo, uh, and that uh, uh, study different domains in the area of health science. It's also supported by uh, two international organizations that are working towards open science and open data in the area of genomic medicine, which are the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health and the Human Varium Project, which is linked to UNESCO. And we are uh, supported in terms of financial resources uh, from FAPESP, who gives uh, money to the five uh, centers of excellence, and, uh, and the centers uh, give us uh, money to uh, be able to develop this project. So we are organized in a very simple way. We have a formal steering committee that meets uh, uh, regularly, and uh, they, they represent the different uh, research centers that were involved initially in the uh, initiative, and they are from different uni universities in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, we also have a technical committee, which are people that are in charge of the day-to-day -day, uh, running of the project. And that in includes uh, Professor Benilton de Sá Carvalho, who is an assistant professor in, the, uh, in statistics at Unicamp, and uh, Cristiane Rocha, who is the project manager and database curator. And we developed uh, our database, or databases now, uh, based on the uh, federated ecosystem for sharing genomic and clinical data, which has been proposed by the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, and uh, was uh, discussed in this paper published in Science in 2016. Uh, and we're taking advantage of all the resources that are being developed by the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which includes documents, products, and the support for projects aiming to foster data sharing in the areas of genomics, genomic medicine, and health sciences. So we're part of one of the demonstration projects from the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is the Beacon Project who aims to uh, put together in an easier way uh, for the user uh, different databases around the world. So there are currently more than 100 beacons in different countries in all continents of the world. 
uh, with more than 500 data sets and including more than 500,000 individuals represented in the genomic databases. And if you are interested to know a little bit about the, uh, about the Beacon project, you can access this address and there you have an idea of how this works in, in terms of connecting uh, different databases uh, around the world. We're also part of uh, a, a, another initiative from the Global Alliance, which is the National Initiatives Network uh, that uh, uh, puts together the genomic uh, and in medicine national initiatives around the world, including from Australia, the UK, Canada, uh, France, uh, the African Initiative, uh, specific disease such as cancer initiatives, uh, as well as the Precision Medicine Initiative uh, in the U.S. And we are one of these uh, of, of the members of this uh, group, which is very useful because uh, since we uh, meet personally once a year, we can discuss. Uh, problems, difficulties, and find solutions that are going to be harmonized and standardized across different projects. Uh, our uh, genomic databases are uh, based in the LOVD2, uh, which was de developed by the Leiden Open Variation uh, Database Group, and uh, that is adopted worldwide. It's a completely open source uh, database that can be further modified by the user. And uh, that's what, what you, you get when you access our website and you go to databases. Uh, here you can uh, search uh, at different domains in terms of uh, genomic information. And I'm not going into a lot of detail on this because I know that most people are not from the genomics field here. But uh, uh, you can have access to... Uh, different uh, types of data in terms of genomic characteristics and phenotypic uh, information. And because we're dealing with information for, from individuals and there is a chance that these individuals uh, that donated their samples to be included in the database could be recognized and identified even though we don't include any identifiable uh, link or information. Uh, we have uh, adopted a two-tier access to our data. We have a first access which is completely unrestricted. You don't have to identify yourself when you log into our website. And, and that's the standard access level. And it does not require user registration or authentic, uh, authentication. And users, users can access all the statistics, list of genomic variants, and frequency. Uh, we, in this access, users do not have uh, access to individualized data from uh, the individuals that are participating in the different databases. However, if you decide that the data is useful for you, you can request uh, the VCF files, which are variant uh, uh, information files, and then you can access the restricted level, which requires regist registration. And we can transfer to you the specific data sets you are interested in. To do that, you have to sign a data sharing agreement, which is in our website. And among the different conditions there, you are required to say you are not going to try to identify anyone uh, uh, among the, the, the different uh, data sets. We have also been developed some bioinformatics tools, and the person who is in charge of this part is uh, Benilton Carvalho and, uh, and uh, Cristiani uh, Rocha. And uh, we have implemented a number of security measures to protect the data and to assure that the data is going to be available whenever people uh, log into the website. So we have four different murals located in different geographic uh, uh, regions of the state of Sao Paulo. We also have recently launched the uh, BIPMED in the cloud uh, using resources that were created at the University of Campinas. And if you are interested in knowing a little bit more about this, uh, you will refer to uh, Benilton Carvalho. You can contact him. 
and uh, he can uh, tell you all about uh, the technical tools and uh, bioinformatics uh, products that uh, the group is developing. We also have uh, a lot of interest in terms of training and education, and especially Benito is very involved in this project, which is financed by international uh, agencies, and that aims to boost data-driven biology in Latin America. So there are a number of uh, workshops and courses that are being promoted uh, using this uh, project. So just to give an idea how our uh, genomic databases are organized, they are divided in two uh, different parts. The reference databases, which uh, contain information on genomic sequences and uh, polymorphisms of what we call reference population, and that's mainly obviously Brazilian uh, population. And uh, we don't like to call them uh, controls or normals because we know that if a person is completely no, uh, healthy, the person is not normal. So there, there, there are, there are certain, uh, based, not based on disease, uh, but based on geographic location or where they live in Brazil. Uh, and then we have disease-specific databases in which variants that are related to disease are being uh, displayed. And we have a number of uh, different diseases I have listed just a uh, tree uh, here, uh, but I have another four slides of, uh, of the databases and I don't have time to show you. But when we started to deal with the disease, we introduced another level of uh, um, uh, information, which is phenotypic and clinical information. And for, uh, and for that, uh, the LOVD.2, it's very useful because we can tailor uh, the type of information we're going to uh, enter uh, based on the phenotype we're interested. So basically, what we want to give to the users, it's enough phenotypic information that uh, they will be able to use the genomic information in a, a, a useful way for their specific projects. Uh, but then there's the question, is people uh, access, accessing your database? Well, I can say yes, we have an average uh, number of access of 75 a day. And uh, as you can see, on weekends, we have a significant drop in the number of uh, visits, which makes us uh, uh, believe that this, these are not robots, they're real people that uh, take uh, the weekends off. So it seems that people are accessing the data and using this. Uh, and uh, we have access from all over the globe, as you can see, uh, but mainly from Brazil, which makes me very happy, and uh, from the United States, but we have access from uh, different countries as well. Uh, and more recently, this was May last year, we decided to uh, take this initiative to other countries in Latin America. So we launched the portal Latin Gen, and you can uh, visit uh, the, uh, the portal at www.latingen.org. And the objectives of LatinGen, which is the database of genetic variation, is to act as a centralizer of genomic information in Latin America, to provide assistance for other research groups that are interested in having their own uh, uh, open uh, databases of genomic information. And so far, we have three databases. Those are uh, databases that are uh, open. Uh, and uh, including BitMed and another database in Brazil, which is hosted at the University of Sao Paulo. And we also have more recently a, a genomic database from Argentina. The good thing about this uh, two databases, BitMed and the database from Argentina, is that they are, uh, they were constructed in this using LOVD, so they are completely uh, interop interoperable. And we also have other projects, other research uh, uh, groups that are interested in launching their, their public databases. So we're acting together with them uh, in order to make this uh, available. And uh, so I only have three minutes, but I have to tell you why it's important to have a Brazilian database. And the reason it's in this slide. Uh, 
uh, of the uh, uh, over uh, 600,000 variants we identified among the reference population, 14.8% of the variants in, in, in normal individuals, in, in control individuals, those are not necessarily related to disease, they have never been reported in any other public genomic database in the world. So we are being able to disclose another level of genetic variability that may or may not be related to disease, which is very important for, for the genomic studies worldwide and specific, specifically for the Brazilian and Latin American population. And that's the same thing for uh, common variants. Uh, so I will end now, and uh, please visit us at bipmed.org. Uh, leave your uh, impression of our websites and our services, and uh, I'm open for questions. <laughs> and I have some flyers that I'm going to leave here, so if you are interested to know a little bit more, please take one. Thank you very much, Isia. So you're very good in time. There's uh, time for one or two questions from the audience. So you met, yeah? Yes. Yeah, you answered all my questions from today in the morning. Um, <laughs> but I was thinking, uh, do you think this can be used for... Uh, let's say clinical data without genomics or other types of results. I have no idea how this, the inner works of this thing, but uh, yes, I believe genomics is not, not the whole story, right? Sure, I believe so. Uh, I strongly believe that we started with genomic data because it's very well standardized, is the easy part. Uh, but as you move to the phenotypic and clinical data, things are going to get a little bit more complex, but not at all it's impossible to set up uh, the tools and the databases. One more question. Yes, Sandy. Um, you said that people have to sign an agreement that they won't try to identify people. What do you, what protection do you have in place in case somebody does? Somebody, somebody does identify people. Well, oh. the, best, the best protection we have is to have very large database because as the databases get larger and larger, it becomes mm. more difficult to identify people. So this is a specific problem when you have very small disease-related databases, and we're trying not to have that. But you are right. You are right. We cannot enforce this. I mean, but... At least we have an agreement that the person who have to, so the, the, the research scientist has to sign and the head of the institution has to sign it as well. So we, uh, so far we haven't had any problems, uh, with this type of, uh, but you are absolutely right. There is the risk, but as someone said in the morning, when you are dealing with open data, there is a, a certain level of trust that has to happen. Uh, when you are uh, dealing with uh, this level. I think the reason I'm raising it, I mean, I, I really don't believe that people, scientists, are going to be exploiting or misappropriating these databases. But I do know a lot of people are concerned that, for example, insurance companies or, you know, somebody will get in there and find out that they've got dreaded lurgy A and therefore there will be problems. So this is, if you like, it's a perception by the people out there that this might be a problem that we have to find ways of addressing. Absolutely. I agree. Thank you very much. Isian, Thank thanks you. for the questions. You nicely showed the initiatives and this huge network you're working in. So we will continue with the second presentation by Mauricio Barreto. Barreto? And the Center of Data and Knowledge Integration for Health, please. Okay. Oh, so I'm, I, I prepared my talk for, to be on 20 minutes. Then I only have 15 minutes. I knew not now. I will approach then you. I, I'm going quicker than, than uh, may I try to explain. Yeah, the center also has a more than one year old. Yeah, it's very young center. Huh? And it is an experience also in the health field. As you see, the health area has some characteristics yeah, that are different from others, yeah? But I think the general idea of data, yeah, and accumulate data and have a, a great number 
of people né, to, to, to do studies is the main objective of this kind of data accumulation house. Uh, uh, why this this happen? Yeah, you have a lot of problems in the hum humanity that's not been solved at all. Yeah, and the 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 our, our system, uh, recession developed system, has been very lent and costly. Yeah, in terms of solving this problem, and then some hopes. Yeah, that this increase this this initiative can increase the chance to to find things. Yeah, or find the results and solution for some problem. And is in all the fields, the, the, the health data, healthcare data in general, is increasing very, very quickly. Yeah. And then the, the amount of data accumulated is huge. Yeah. If you take any, each one of us, yeah, in our history, yeah, in, our, in the health system, how much data is accumulated for each of us? Now, if you put this in a large population, uh, the number, the amount of data has increased very, very, very quickly. Yeah. And in some science, you have the idea to accumulate data, yeah, and to put uh, different layers of data together. For example, in geography, yeah, like here. But in human, uh, as uh, the idea is similar in health, yeah, to to join this data, yeah, is more or less with recession does, yeah, when you do a launch now a cohort study, for example, and you put together a lot of data on individuals, yeah, then uh, you try to put as much data as possible, yeah, not only genomic, yeah, but there is a lot of different data, yeah, that can be put together, create a, a, a healthy data ecosystem, yeah, that can join this data. This is an aspiration, I don't mean that it's easy to do that, yeah. And in this way, the, 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 the idea of a research and the idea of a clinical né, activity can go closer yeah, than before. Yeah, that in the in the way that you use yeah, more clinical data yeah, or routine data yeah, to, to improve research and make the, 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 the difference né, among research and clinical activities more closer. Yeah. But one important thing is to how to transform this big data in knowledge. Yeah, this I think is a problem for every science. Yeah, how this this could be useful. Yeah, to produce useful knowledge. Then uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, challenges. Yeah, from different types. Yeah, some have been discussed here. Yeah, for example, the heterogeneity of data that's very common in the health field. Yeah, the data had not been standardized before. Yeah, it's very common that. Availability and one important point, point is privacy. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, in the health field, the privacy question is very strong question. Yeah, it's different from other areas. Yeah? Then the center that you create, CDAX, is in Salvador. is related to Fiocruz. is a part of Fiocruz, but related to the Federal University of Bahia also. Yeah, is an effort. Yeah, to test some of these ideas. Yeah. And only to, to say the history, yeah, you, 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 I'm part of a group of research that for a long time has worked in an area called social determinants of health. How the society, yeah, and how the way the people live influence on health, yeah, is our major focus, yeah, of research, yeah. And you try to do some studies, yeah, different line of studies, yeah. One of the line of studies was evaluation, yeah. Of what you call conditional cash transfer, that in Brazil is Bolsa Família, né? and you did some studies evaluating the impact of Bolsa Família on health, yeah. But using uh, aggregated data, the, 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 what I talked before, not individual data, but data uh, accumulated by municipalities in Brazil. Né? But then later, né, you you decide that you, you can't go over that initial né, investigation. And create yeah, another or use it, né, a, a Brazilian database that is the Cadastro Único yeah, to do the studies. Yeah? If you use the Cadastro Único, you have an idea having now over 100 million people né, uh, that have this form complete in Cadastro Único. And then the Ministry of Social Development accepts and donates the, the database to the center. Né, this, you did a lot of work to, to, to harmonize this data. And I'm not talking in detail here, but there is a lot of computation and the 
strategy to harmonize, yeah, and to arrive to a baseline of 140 million people, yeah. Then you create with your call 100 at the court of 100, 100 million Brazilian, yeah. And in general, né, in the normal investigation, né, a cohort study you have a few thousand of people, yeah. Sure that you have a great details of data, yeah, it's, it's collected to your own research. In, uh, in this case, you're using secondary data now with some limits, but you can do uh, uh, in a very large yeah, scale. Yeah? You can connect that in, in principle, yeah, which is a lot of health databases that exist in Brazil, yeah, to evaluate the effects of social policy on health. Yeah? This was the major, the original idea of the creation of the center. Né? But to do that, you need to do a lot of processing, yeah, in a very safe environment, yeah, like mainly things like clean pre-processing. And one thing that is important in that stage, that is the linkage of data, because you have different databases that you need to link in this database. Then you need to, it was necessary, the development of the algorithms, yeah, to do this linkage in the very high speed and the, yeah, using millions and millions of, of possibilities of linkage. And then CDAX, yeah, the data center of CDAX was created with this idea, yeah, that with great level of safety, yeah, uh, and capable with capability to do and to operate, yeah, this uh, database with some millions of people, yeah, in a very safe environment, yeah. Here is the, the, the way the center is. The center is located in a, in this building, yeah. This building was built up by the uh, state of Bahia, the, the secretary of uh, science and technology, yeah, to be a, is a, to be a startup is of a, in IT area, yeah, and then is a state of the art building, yeah, prepared to IT initiatives, and they give you as a nice space there. You have a safety room. Yeah, it's a very room in part of our area. Yeah, you have a safety room that is completely closed room. Yeah, with very high uh, level of security and protection. Yeah, then in this room is the where the data is kept. Yeah, and no one, uh, no data. Yeah, can be out of this room in any way. Yeah, it's not linked to the internet. And it's connected, yeah, with a computer center that is situated two kilometers from this building. Yeah, it's a supercomputer center. Yeah, on the point of your computing process is done. Yeah, through a system that is completely closed. Yeah, the RNP, uh, the national head national de pesquisa, then make this link for us. Yeah, and then you work in this what in general. Uh, people call the safety raven. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of safe, safety haven to uh, uh, work. Yesterday, my colleague presented this. Yeah, is the, the, the areas né, that the Seed Act is organized. Yeah, you have an, an area of data production that is working well, it's doing a lot of things. Yeah, a data curation area. Yeah, and you have a data access that is growing now. Yeah, and you hope in the near future you have a a, a, a more yeah capability of data access yeah and uh, the, uh, based on this all this process ethics privacy and security yeah here is the computational resource that you have yeah to access that you are now organized that but you have compute, computational resource for analysis data production and the operational uh, activities yeah and then uh uh uh, uh I'm going here a big question, as I said, the, the data is data privacy, yeah. But I'm not going in details, yeah. There is some paper here that you would be interested that is discuss deeply this this process, yeah, in great detail. Yeah, there is a, a workflow, yeah. You have a very clear workflow, yeah. Since the request of the data, yeah, the arrival of the new data, the request of the data. In the process, yeah, the stages of process, yeah, the pipeline of this process is well defined, yeah, because it's not so easy, yeah. I don't know if you have an idea, but uh, you have a, a component that is the linkage process, yeah. The linkage is a probabilistic process. The computational people know about that well. 
yeah that take uh, uh even with high speed yeah uh, algorithms you take longer to do that then is a uh, is a uh, 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 very computing, yeah, demanding uh, each stage. That is the linkage, le linkage stage, stage, yeah. But the the main purpose of that is to produce data set, yeah, that is open, yeah, that will be open and is transfer to the analysis stage, yeah. Because they, they uh, unidentified data sets, yeah, which all the 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 care about identification, yeah, that is a very critical point now. Yeah, then you are in process in an area of investigation, yeah, that despite uh, some people, yeah, uh, uh, is growing, yeah, the concern about the possibility of identification, yeah. Then uh, anyone who work in this area need to be, to take a lot of measures, yeah, to decrease the chances of identification, yeah. The vision of the center is to be sustainable, yeah, you, it's, it's an experience, yeah, that's kept by recession money, yeah, but the idea is to find a way to create sust sustainability, to be a, a very close to the legal framework, you use data, yeah, that is uh, data from the Brazilian health system, yeah, then the legal framework that you, you supervise that, yeah, is yet in development in Brazil, this is a question, yeah. The ethical problem, the governance, yeah, there is all a complex system of governance that involve external bodies and internal bodies and groups, yeah, to, to give you uh, access and to, uh, uh, for anyone for this data, yeah, and to make it strong this public interface for data sharing, yeah. I'm going here, yeah, as a first experience, yeah, if you see a recent call from CNPQ and Gates Foundation, yeah, you are the suppliers, one of the suppliers of the data, yeah. This has been a strong test for CDAX, yeah, to serve a supplier of data, yeah. In fact, yeah, you are giving access, yeah, to the data for any grantee that receive the grant and plan to use data from CDAX. The, the grantee can apply for all type of data, it's not only obliged to be for CDAX, but in the call, if you read in the call, yeah, the, the main purpose is to develop the data science in health in Brazil, yeah, and uh, if it's possible, yeah, uh, data from CDAX must be used. Then you have the compromise with the CNPQ, Minister of Health and Fund Gate Foundation, yeah, to give it to these people access. This be a kind of a test for CEDAX, yeah, to test our capabilities, yeah, to offer to external groups, yeah, the access for data, yeah, that is not, uh, uh, that's not accessible easily, yeah, because if you do this linkage, it's not an easy process for a normal investigation to do. Then, this is a very interesting, and who is interested, please go to the, CNPQ uh, web page here yeah, in this call, and the people here can apply. It's very easy to apply. It's the only call that the application takes two pages. Yeah, it's only two pages and a great idea. Yeah, if you have two pages and a great idea, you can win $100,000. Yeah, and uh, uh, solve uh, a nice problem. Yeah, no, and be better if you are, uh, if your project is developing well. You can go to a second stage, yeah, and they apply to a million dollars, yeah. And then is a very nice grant for young people, yeah, bright young people to 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 do efforts. Then, uh, in my view, yeah, to develop a long-term strategic vision for a health big data ecosystem in Brazil, is necessary a very clear legal framework to improve your legal framework. You don't have yet a legal, yeah, definition on that on that question, yeah. You have a a, a lie that is a information law, but is not complete in these terms. Yeah, a balance on ethics. Yeah, and stimulate. Yeah, uh, the, the the this database can be very useful. Yeah, to produce solution that this is a giving some utility. Yeah, on that. Yeah, because a lot of people is only concerned on privacy and the ethics, but it, I think you need to find a balance between. Yeah? Use, yeah, and no use, yeah. To develop a, a governance, yeah, a more national base for data share. To strengthen the infrastructure, yeah, it's not trivial, yeah. The, the, this complex system needs a uh, reasonable infrastructure, yeah. 
For example, in our case, you can't use the clouds, yeah, because you, you work with privacy, with a quite a privacy, yeah. The clouds are a place for public data, yeah, or data that you have not so much concern on privacy. Then, uh, this is a problem. You need to build up infrastructure in, in safe environments, yeah. And the uh, uh, last point is to train a new generation of research in an interdisciplinary and collaborative research model. Né? I think you, you imprint yeah, the idea of the scientist as an individual. Yeah? And uh, I think it time more yeah, with this kind of, of things yeah, is made clear that science is a collaborative, uh, uh, interdisciplinary and a more complex yeah, activity than a uh, 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 glory of uh, one person, yeah? Then I think this needs to be, to have a training process, yeah? To, to the new generation of research to understand very clearly, practice that, yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Marisa, you did a well job. Questions, or well, there's time for one question. Then I have a quick one. You, you said you started one year ago. How much time did you have for the preparation of everything to set this to set this up? Before inauguration, yeah, we had two years, yeah, two, two and a half years, years to to prepare, yeah, okay. to find money, yeah, to find the the organize the infrastructure, the contracts and things around two and a half years, yeah, in preparation of that, yeah. Okay, and I'm not talking about myself here, yeah, but me and the team of, of people I don't present here, but it is a group of colleagues that support the initiative. A quick question. Um, you raised towards the end of your presentation the problem with, uh, possible pro problem with cloud services and privacy issues, data with privacy issues. Um, do, do you have, well, two questions. Do you know if in Brazil there is a plan to provide Cloud services for research. Yeah, and there is some. I'm not going to know the details. I, I know that the national or oh, the HNP, uh, the head national de pesquisa, has a plan. I don't know where this plan is going. Yeah, but even that, mm -hmm. you 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 think is not the solution. Yeah, because the cloud is a is a question is is not open, but in some way don't have a level protection. Yeah, at least on the as we are resp responsible, yeah, for the primes of this data, yeah, you don't feel safe, yeah, to put in any cloud this kind of data. I think, at least as far as I know, yeah, uh, in my group, you have evaluated the situation, yeah, you work with a different group of people from the LNCC here in Petropolis, yeah, and the other people have discussed about that. And you're not safe here yeah, to put identified data on cloud. Yeah. Identified data. Okay. Identified that's, data. that's clear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much again. So I will hand over to our next speaker, which is Maria Kunkel from Universidad Federal de Sao Paulo. And she will speak about open access data in forensics anthrop anthropometry of Brazil. First yours. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to be here today about our project. Long BG, open access data, open access data for Brazilian forensic anthropometry. I am Maria Elisete. I am a professor in the Federal University of São Paulo in the Science and Technology Institute. I coordinate the group Biomechanics and Forensic and I collaborate with the Center de Anthropologia and Archaeology of Forensic da Unifesp. Forensic anthropology is the area of the science that acts in human identification. The identification from, from remains of bones or forms of ditches or accidents, or in some cases from evidence found at crime scenes such as handprints. The forensic anthropometry is a an, um, very important tool to study the measurement and proportion of the human body. And for human identification is estimated from the biological profile. In the biological profile come characteristics such as age, sex, ancestry, and statehood. 
The relationships between anatomical structures can be used for estimation of one structure from different of order. For example, to estimate the height of a person from measurement of a hand or feet. Unlike other countries, Brazil don't have a reliable anthropometric database. We use data from other countries or we use methods that are developed with data of other countries. And for example, to estimate the stature of one person can be estimated from measurement of body structures like hands and feet or feet. And in our case, for human identification, the Brazilian forensic expert uses methods or mathematical equations that are derived from data of other countries, or other kinds of population, for example, USA or Europe or Africa. And in the case of estimation specific for a state in Brazil, we have problem if, if we think about that our population has a differentiated anatomical constitution, and we have a high miscegenation, and if we use methods based in other population, we can go to incorrect results. Many other countries have very good studies about the anthropometric databases, but we don't have one and, and related to anatomical structures. So we need anthropometric data for the Brazilian population. And this is a pilot study. This is the, the mount BG. Mount is, means hands and BG mean, uh, means basic data. And we are working with the possibility to have a big one uh, database with hands measurements and status of persons. We did this study with 500 volunteers of Sao Paulo and men's and women and we have measured, measured seven parameters per hand. And from these people, we have information about sex, age, ethnicity, citizenship, and dominant hand. For that, we use two different um, methods to measure it. Because the first one is the standard method, is the direct measurement is with a digital caliper. This is the standard procedure to do in anthropology. But with this possibility, it is very hard to, ha to have a very big data, a very number of persons to consider representative of Brazil. So we investigated this other, the other method is to use a scanner, not a 3D scanner, but a desk scanner and a software free to do the measurement direct in a computer, the image jotted. The methods were compared and one has chosen to be more suitable for research in over Brazil. We work at sex just to define this protocol. And the results showed that the indirect method is easier and faster than the direct method and can be used for acquisition of data of several places in Brazil. We just need a scanner and free software and chocolate for the volunteers. We use it, uh, we, we try to have a low cost and very effective. <laughs> So the Mount VD is the first significant collection of multimedia information and anthropometrical data, hence linear measurements and images, and status of about 500 volunteers of Sao Paulo states. This is just a pilot study, but this is the first one that we can consider to, to do a research. And uh, the second stage of this research is to have a collaborative open access database of the population of the Brazil. Brazil is characterized by different groups of population and different regions. So to create a national anthropometric database, the acquisition of measurements from the volunteers will be carried out with collaborative work of several universities. And now the data will be available in an open platform for forensic analysis. The aims of this stage is to obtain a representative hands database from public federal university of all Brazilian states. So in this moment, photos for about 30,000 volunteers and will be a collaborative open access database and will be shared in a web interface. The methodology that we will use is the standard protocol that we have defined the pilot institute to ensure the data quality from photos and low resource and reduction of the time. The measurement will be done in all institutions. I mean the measurement of the photos with a computer program. 
the methodology can be replicated in other countries, or we can use that for to obtain a database of other parts of the core. So when we need this data, why this data is important? I told about the important to because it's important to use this data to estimate high, for example, state rule in the forensic. But we have many other applications. We have application, for example, to develop more accurate protocols for forensic identification. I mean, more accurate with using another uh, statistical methods, mathematical methods, like uh, linear regression, multiple linear regressions, and so on. And we can now do st studies um, of finger length ratio. This is the important relationship be between the second and the fourth finger. And this is used to for diagnosing and prediction of some disease like cancer or indicator of sex difference. Now the, the data have been applied in other areas such as automatic acquisition of hand parameters by artificial intelligence. We are working on the possibility to have the measurements just from the pictures. Now we have an algorithm to use the pictures and to have automatically the measurements. That will be great. Now I will show two examples for application of the, that are developing in my laboratory. We use the data that we have for agronomic and biomechanics. We are developing low-cost orthosis 3D printed for child with cerebral palsy. We use well, the possibility with this database to for just one measuring, we have the other measuring, and we have the possibility to have a modeling, 3D modeling, fast and effective. The second one is to use the data to, for example, for model a hand for one person that has lost the two hands. I have no one hand to compare. Right? I, we have this program, then the program is mounted traced. We have this is an open design, the models are free too, and this is a low cost 3D printed hand prothesis to people. I want to say thanks for uh, Professor Dr. Flavia Cristina and the Felipe Granado, he, he did his master degree with this, uh, the development of this database. And I want to show, please, a short video. This is just a gift to show the different possibilities of the variability in the hand. This is the kind of models that you have. You have to put this mark in different points of, point of the hand, and you have the uh, fingerprint is not identified, and you use different procedures to have a very precise measurement. And that is what we want to do in all Brazil. For your attention, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Questions from the audience? Yep. <laughs> uh, would you guys would you guys thought to present this project to the uh, to enlarge the database in the uh, national civil register? Or in the electro uh, when the people have to to put the finger to oh, scan all the the hand, mm. or or when when the people go to doing civil cadaster, mm. could you you, you mean use another possibility to acquisition of the hands? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes. We are looking for that, but uh, the the important point is that we need to have a standard. Acquisition and the, the same uh, resolution, or uh, we have a bigger and uh, higher air hole. But it's okay. There's time for one more question. Here, here please. Thank you. Following a little bit what he just said, uh, I wonder about. Uh, is it pressed enough so that you cannot identify the the hands? Yes, for this because case. because that makes you 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 are allowed to in this case, identify the person. Yes, we don't need the fingerprint. Yeah, this okay. Is the, 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 so the, it's very important yes. that your scan, your image, 
yes. has not. I was not so able. So some, some stick is here in the in the fingers. Okay, and that's then, important. That yeah. was included in our protocol. Okay, we, need, <laughs> we have we have uh, 30 points in the protocol that we we follow. This is one of the points. Thank you again. The clock is still running, but we were late in starting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, now we come to a different topic. Marta Tupinamba de Uroa, I hopefully I pronounced it right. She will speak about music in 18th century periodicals. Please. Thank you very much. It's, it's fascinating to be here because, I mean, so many different topics and, and even like to, to see how so many different people also, right? It's, and they, that's, that's amazing. And I, I come to talk with, from something that, uh, my, it's not, it's not yet being, uh, making database in the humanities because I'm talking about raw data. The thing is that when, when we, we I, or any other like historians or musicians or uh, we we uh, research we have a lot of data that we are we don't use actually because then we we, we it's like we we have a, a survey in and and then we don't know what we are going to find and so when i start I, it, this is a, like a pilot and I started doing this uh, in 2001 when I started doing some research to collect data from newspapers. And so I'm going to show you uh, the the actual project. And not it's not really a, how to say a database uh, a project uh, that is being set. The policies are being made in my university. Uh, let me see. This database was started in 2002, and I started collecting uh, uh, in the, in the uh, newspapers, in, in uh, big microfilms. I started collecting news from, uh, how to say, music in the 19th century. Because the histories of popular music, actually, they have been done like that. People would read the paper and then they put together everything that was happening and then they they just uh, wrote the histories but then they had like sort of a an ideological sort of 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 set like for instance in Brazil they had like two musical genres that they considered very to be very important the modinha and the lundu the Brazilians would would just the two None of or other genres were were sort of collected data for that. But then, and what I saw uh, is that the collection was very slow because, like in the the uh, library, we had like very few uh, microfilm readers, and also they we have problems with like they have like. Uh, renovations, <laughs> you know, what it is, is to, to be working in, in, uh, how to say, uh, uh, the, in, in a library. The thing is, we started doing, uh, uh using the, uh, the computer. And then because we had to collect it by hand. And so, uh, we started sort of, of putting it into, in the, our own database. And it was a very good improvement to have, to be able to, to, uh, to input some data from, from your home instead of, of just transcribe. And that's the machine that we, we used. We say that it was actually, we have in Brazil, like, it, nas coxas, like, because you see, <laughs> It's like they understood because you see we didn't, we didn't have a <laughs> it's it's you know it's a it's it was it's an improvised if I can say 
because we didn't have place to, to put our paper. You have to put actually right there, right? And, but to see this machine uh, also, uh, how to say, highlights something that's very important for researchers is the media. Because to see a microfilm is, is still uh, a media that stands for a long time. Like when the first time that I used the CD, I said, no, the, that is going to evaporate. And it can't evaporate like that. And so, and also, uh, uh, we are having, how to say, several problems of uh, the permanence of the, the media. And so I think that's, that's interesting to think about that. That's because that's a problem for the researcher. And there, we used the, this first, how to say, database was set in a different mainframe than the, the regular one in, in Unirio. It was called www4. <laughs> It was like a computer that I put there, over there. And then it was in Access and ASP. And the thing is, this, this thing, it was 2002, right? The thing is, uh, afterwards, we've, we had lots of problems with that. And, and we also did, at that time, until 2009, uh, we did research with the actual paper. That's a, a whole different and fascinating way of doing research. And uh, we used all those, uh, how to say, libraries to do the research. And the, the database came li like that. We had like, a, a, how to say, the, 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 the newspaper, and then we had, we had the, the citation. We put the citation like that at that time. In 2012, uh, it was launched at the, the a very interesting thing. It's the Brazilian Digital Newspaper Library, and uh, at the with OCR uh, uh, technology, which like makes uh, how to say it's exponentially opens up a lot for research. And uh, the query can be done on around uh, 2,000 titles, just for, I mean, mostly from the 19th century. And, uh, and you can do, do it by title, period, edition, place of publication, keyword. So it's, uh, it's amazing what you can do. And the thing what we you you might you might ask, right? Why we have we need open data in the humanities, right? Because most of the the research is done uh, individually. Like you have people who sort of or sort of I mean in small groups or whatever. Because it's like it's not like it's not like a case in the in, in health. Right? And I say to you, it's like, as I mentioned before, the process of research in, in the humanities is very rhizomatic because you start from a point and, do, and then you get to other, other places. And, and so you collect a lot of data that you are not going to use to write your paper. And that's what uh, was a motivation for me since the beginning, to write, put that data in a place so that other people could use it. And that's the principle of open science, right? And then, because, for instance, for, from 19th century newspapers, besides the advertisement of the theaters, for instance, you have uh, the advertisement for runaway slaves. Like for the students that I... I worked, worked with me. Uh, we, I had to leave like three months for people to just get accustomed to the horror of, of dealing with, with slavery. And also, like alongside information on one musical genre, 
you can find other kinds of stuff. And I, I, I found out just from the newspapers that along the, a very, very famous Lundu in, from the 19th century, ah, uh, there was, uh, there was a connection with a, a, a Spanish dance, the Cachucha, uh, which choreography was done by a German, <laughs> a German, <laughs> yes, a German dancer in Paris. <laughs> That's at es Esler. That's that, that lady over there. The thing is that the tune from that guy, that song was played in a uh, bar organs, organillo in, in Spanish, eh, 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 in Portuguese. And then so in the streets over here, very close to here in the Rio de Janeiro, and it was played by slaves eh, running the thing. And then the composer of that song, heard that over and over again, and then a piece of that came into that famous Brazilian song. And so my discovery was, long before Edison's phonograph, I had like a mechanical transmission right here, you understand? So you, you, can, you, you can discover lots of things just by dealing with all that different material. In 2015, I started a new project. Now I started on the walls. Because people think that the walls is just Vienna. It's not from Vienna. Because in, in all Latin America, it was sort of appropriated. And, uh, and what happened, it was that uh, I with contact with other researchers, I realized that there was lots of people working with 19th century music. And so, eh, eh, not just music, salon music, but opera. And also, like with the transits from the musicians from one place to other, you think that uh, a, a genre, a musical genre, is slow to, to it's not just today that's fast to, to go around the world. It was fast in, in the 16th century also. In the 19th century, you have, like, for instance, the, the walls started uh, in, 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 very soon. It came, like the polka also. It was very fast to, to, and to come to Brazil. And, and from here also, it spread all over. But the thing is that my project, my database, but very little database, was that the, the, the technology was much outdated. And also the, the, that, that main framework, the, the, the computer was to be discontinued. It's almost discontinued. So they asked me to update the technology that I'm doing with with uh, how to say open software and etc. Et and the thing is the, and then also I took the how to say the opportunity to uh, also change a little bit of the, my metadata. Before I had like a, a, a personal sort of research project with my students and then now I'm sort of making it possible to come to have more people. So I also have identified the project and so the, 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 the people involved in the project and all the other things. And in, the, uh, for the future of this, there are some uh, colleagues from other country that we are meeting in Puerto Rico in June. And so we have people from Chile, from Brazil, several, Colombia, Venezuela, and also uh, Argentina and Uruguay, some Cubans too, and people from Spain uh, wanting to sort of join in. The future of this, uh, it will depend of other, 
how to say measurements like like doing sort of how to say a, a, a collaborations between the universe so that that I can use this one in my my institution is not like a, a, a big thing like you have in, in Frio Cruz that can get data from other from other how to say institutions. A repository in in my institution has its own policies that are doing being developed. And so that's why that's that's my last one. Uh -huh. And and that's to in order to have this this profile and maybe be a more how to say uh, larger database, right? It it has to to meet the, the all the the standards that you have been talking here. And uh, we have like Unihil is is very strong in the humanities, digital humanities. We had last last uh, how to say week we had a, a a whole congress on that. And and then so I think that we what we can do is that Unihil is developing its own how uh, policy. And so maybe I don't know yet if. There will be room for raw database <laughs> uh, data because mostly it's like the repositories are for articles and things like that. But who knows? I I hope that they are be how to say sensitive to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta. I guess there are some questions. Yeah, then. Do you know if there's any work being done to automatically search for all kinds of topics and relationships in microfiche related data? Because this seems to me a natural thing to do almost, you know, is to, to apply some kind of automated processes to Historical documents. Yes, I'll, I'll look into that. What we can, what the OCR in that that uh, how to say that that uh, that is a database also, right? And it goes uh, to that the 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 page with where that word is. And so you have like uh, you can you copy it because the 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 library doesn't allow it to to download it. You get an image. Of it and or transcribe it and uh, and but then it will have to be like a reading like a, a PDF reading or something like that it could be it could be because I'll look into it thank you very much thank you Marta and we can oh there's one oh I allow this yes one moment but a short one who was it Thank you. I think you have a, a good opportunity because uh, next year at Unihil, uh, the postgraduate program of uh, uh, will start a, a professional master degree at management, not management. And I believe that it could be a good, a good stud, study for, for, for doing it for some students. And uh, I can tell that to the people to know about this, this editor, how to say editor, I don't know, <laughs> uh, medication, yes. And in the next month, it will be available at the higher page. A program is part of the same with the economy and the strength of so Thank you. That's a helpful thing. Thank you. So we will come to the last speaker of the session. This is Lautaro Matos from Argentina. And he will speak about exploring large science and technology data collections using online semantic maps. Please. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to be here presenting. Okay. Let me try this. Okay. First, I want to tell a little bit about who we are and we, we, what are. Oh. Ah. Sorry. Uh, 
and who we are and we, uh, what are we doing. Uh, we are an observatory, not an astronomy observatory, but uh, <laughs> I was assigned to the session of the morning, by the way. <laughs> At the first. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> okay. Uh, so we are an observatory of science, technology, and society, and the, re the relation, how the science, technology, and innovation process uh, relate to the society. The main objective of, of our, our work is to process and publish open data on science, technology, and innovation, and higher education. In uh, the region, uh, I mean, with, with the region, I mean the Ibero-American countries because we work with uh, Spain and Portugal as well. Um, the context of our observatory is the organization of Ibero-American states for education, science, and the culture. Um, and we run mainly the, the network, the receipt, which is the network of indicators of science and technology and we have we have data uh, mainly in quantitative quantitative information sets of uh, sets of indicators and series uh, time series of indicators of science and technology we have series of more than 20 years uh, we collect survey the, the the indicators from Euro american countries and publish in a no, uh, we we run normalizing process, um, and we have uh, qualitative information as well, institutional system databases, uh, science policy uh, instruments uh, survey. And we have these metadata collections of open data of different uh, providers such Cielo. Uh, we collect that information, and the tool I am presenting today. It's actually a, a way to observe, to study what is going on in that large textual databases. So we develop uh, this kind of software uh, to collect, process, and analysis the online the online providers, and we are doing natural language processing, data mining, and information visualization to to this. So Intelio, which is the name of the tool, allow us to navigate large volumes. Um, in about 10 years ago, when the data, the, the repositories, the institutional repositories was arising, we found that maybe it is interesting to, to, to see what actually is going on, no, not as a quantity of the information, in, and uh, we thought that it's a good idea to 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 give a a tool to develop a tool to to see what is only in terms of context. So we developed this visual tool to 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 navigate to explore the concepts involved or present in in the in the document. So in technical technologies. Re, uh, extracts relevant concepts using natural language processing in the language of our region, uh, in English, in Spanish, and in Portuguese. Uh, we build a semantic model based, by, based mainly on latent semantic analysis, which is a way to, to link or find well, how the concepts are connected using how they occur in their documents. We build with this information uh, a kind of search engine, engine for information retrieval like Google, but the difference is we give as a result not a list of the documents. We give, uh, we are given uh, a map, a concept map. Uh, to, to achieve that, we, we cluster, we run clustering process and to build the, the, those maps and I want to show you how the uh, how that it's in. We harvest the repositories, which is we uh, and we harvest open patents, open patent services or providers, because we are working 
with patents, with invasion patents as well. And this harvesting, we, we, we are doing offline processing of the data and building some local databases to provide web services for information retrieval, search, clustering, and we are offering that information in a user interface that is public and open, and you can search and uh, give you access and give and build. Uh, we build this 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 UI in a way that you can explore data sources as Cielo, as CSIC of Spain, Rodalic, La Referencia, uh, and a collection of the PCT invasion patents. So the better way to do that, to show the tool is actually use that online, but I have some snapshots here. Uh, the maps are that kind of networks. Uh, you can surely, I have an example here. If you search of brucellosis, you can see how the concepts are linked in the collections of, in, of patents or how brucellosis are represented in Cielo. This is our main, uh, our main objective was give different maps for different contexts for the same concepts. If you search brucellosis in patents or in CSIC in Spain, it's not the same. The map you will obtain is not the same of, of Cielo. We run an example with nanotechnology. If you search nanotechnology in Cielo, the Latin America context of nanotechnology is of studies and documents is quite different of the ones in, in Europe. So as uh, we thought that this tool can be useful as well as uh, for exploring more detail of the patents. So we developed a query language that uh, that query language allows you to to segment uh, different uh, aspects, less, like the, the countries that uh, the um, classification of the patents or different fields of of the data. I want to show you that you can segment one country, one region, one one topic. As an example, like uh, this OCD document is a framework to segment the biotechnology in, in patent database. So you can adapt this strategy to segment and query IntelliGo to present the results of the biotechnology in our region. What are we going now? We're developing a new data store to store more and more data. We are in, uh, incorporating uh, the PubMed uh, baseline database, uh, more patents of LATIPAT, the, um, the United States Office, uh, a better collection of Cielo, and, and the Referencia, which a better metadata schema which will allow, you, allow us to, to give more detailed information and online uh, research. And we are de redesigning the UI with new graphic and functional. And we are developing map mapping of persons with roles and the institutions involved in the process. So uh, this will allow us to present Style online and instant studies uh, of different uh, aspects of the process of the science. So, I think it will be all. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Nataro. We started 10 minutes later, so there's time for questions. I think you gave interesting examples with these visual map service. I was wondering, is it easy for the for the users to read these maps? Yeah, because you can. Uh, the, the better way to show this is actually show the tool online. But you just need to put your your query as in Google and the map just show on and you can explore and filter the authors, the publishers and filter the data and that gives you more and more detailed maps and you can dive into information and see what is going on in a specific topic or and give and you can have access to original documents as well. You can see the map Click a concept and go to the document that originated that concept. And I must say, the concepts are not the keywords or, or, it, they are extracted from the, from the text. So, no, no, not, no, no, no uh, the concepts are not defined by the person or an ontology. It's, it's came up from the text. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Well, uh, a couple of things. I was just playing with it a little bit while you talked. Uh, I, you said that if you press the ball, like Bruxelles is there, the, the, the documents come out. Not the ball, but the concept. The, the, the word. In, in, there, in there? Inside there? Yeah, the, the, if you click. Up, uh, a window uh -huh. with a list of okay. the documents that originated that concept. Okay. The other thing is, uh, can you go backwards one, please? One slide. This? No, the other one. Uh, yes. uh, here, the query. You can only go by, uh, one by one, like Cielo, and then you try, la, yeah. like, is there a way of, like, accessing no, all of because, them? Because the semantic model that I, okay. builds the map mm -hmm. is, is different for each source. Because okay. there, there, uh, we build a different model because the context are different. And the context of Cielo is different of the context of the seek or a reference or whatever. If you see Bruce, uh, two, 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 two concepts, maybe in Cielo, they are very close, but not in, 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 in other contexts. So the, con the, 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 the semantic model tells you, t tells you what is, what we, uh, what is, uh, the con, the context uh, I, I don't know how, how to explain that <laughs> without technical information, but they they give you a, 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 a an idea how that context is 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 representing or the, the that that thing. Yeah, one thing that I, that I found hard to understand is, uh, I mean, how is this concept? Develop because I mean usually like use mesh or uh, okay. or this or you you have a librarian or somebody yeah. who selects the words right. and I I mean who creates the algorithms I mean this artificial intelligence yes. how does it work uh, okay uh, okay uh, is, uh, there are we are using natural language processing to extract we build uh, an, an, uh, a grammar for each for each uh, language. And we extract the concepts based on the known phrases, so the, 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 the composite words around a noun. So the, the noun, the adjectives, and the coordinate, we, we build a grammar, and we extract all that stru uh, uh, structures and analyze that and to, 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 to keep only the ones that are Relevant, the, re the relevance of 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 a concept is given for uh, algorithm based on information theory. More specific in the concept of uh, okay. uh, the concept of <laughs> no 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 the, 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 I, I want to give you an idea of that 
the, the concept of, of how, how they are present in the different doctrines and how, how much information they give. Because if you have 100 documents and all they have water in the contents, water, they no gives you information about that context. But if you have a, a word that, that, a concept that is in three documents, that concept gives you more information because it's very rare. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. I, I think this discussion got me confused here. Okay. Um, You're stupid. <laughs> so, if you are using a, a, a semantic database which is based on two Latin languages, that's mm -hmm. what you're doing, right? Portuguese, no, no. Spanish. No. Okay. Portuguese, Spanish, and similars. No, no, right? no. We have building a model for each language and okay. each source. So we have a model for Cielo in Spanish, well, Cielo in Portuguese, and Cielo in English. Ah, so there comes my question. Okay. Now. Are they perfectly translatable from one no. to the other? No, because so we are not translating. We're, we're talking about science here. No, no, no. It supposedly should be. We are not translating. We are not translating. We are taking the documents in English and we build, build a model for English. We are getting the documents in Portuguese and are maybe the documents only in English, if you, if they don't have an after in Portuguese, they are not processed in the Portuguese context. We are not translating. Even if you use this technique, with a multi-language database, and you don't separate that, the result is the map is a, trans is a kind of translation because the more closer concept, there, are, there will be actually translation in, in, in the different uh, languages. So I think we will close the session yeah. here. So if you can continue in the coffee yeah, break, coffee should track. continue in the coffee you break. Guys should. <laughs> so I want to thank all the speakers thank again for sure. the insights. And also to the audience, and we will meet back here in half an hour. So enjoy the coffee.